I've lost my place, just bear with me. I call upon the University Orator to present a candidate for a degree honoris causa. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Chancellor. Gary Mabbott is an English former professional footballer playing initially for Bristol Rovers, having made his debut in 1979. His performances soon attracted the attention of bigger clubs, and Gary transferred to Tottenham Hotspur in the summer of 1982. International recognition soon followed when he made his full England debut later that year. At Tottenham, he was club captain for 11 years, and with Tottenham, he won the UEFA Cup in 1984, the FA Cup in 1991 as captain, as well as a runners-up medal in the, in the 1987 FA Cup final. In total, he played over 600 games, uh, scoring more than 30 goals for Spurs, and he remains one of the club's longest-serving players. He appeared 16 times for England and made several other appearances for the England under-21s and England B team. In 1993, his reputation as a model sporting professional was further cemented when he was awarded an MBE for services to sport. His impressive professional sporting achievements are even more remarkable given that they were made while living with type 1 diabetes. Having been diagnosed with the condition at the age of 17, no one could tell him whether or not he could pursue his dream of being a professional footballer. His subsequent footballing successes were not without setbacks as he was almost a guinea pig as far as diabetes and regular hard physical exercise are concerned. History reveals, however, that diabetes did not stop him from enjoying almost 20 years at the highest level of sport. While a few others had carved out successful sporting careers, successful diabetic athletes were not generally front or even back page news. However, Gary's amiable personality and media coverage of his diabetes and his sporting achievements meant that he soon became a public face of the condition. He once famously appeared on Blue Peter, where he demonstrated injecting insulin into an orange to show how he dealt with his condition on a daily basis. Gary's determination to make it as a professional footballer must surely have been the inspiration for many others to understand and manage their condition, and even to pursue normal sporting activities. The message that he shares with those with the same condition is that no matter what you want to do in life, diabetes will not stop you. Do not live your life around diabetes, let, let diabetes live around you. Since his retirement, Gary has maintained his sporting connection, serving as an ambassador for the 2010 World Cup finals in South Africa, as well as a, a club ambassador for Tottenham Hotspur and an ambassador for the English Football Association. Perhaps Gary's most important legacy is his hard work to raise awareness of diabetes and to be an inspiration for others in how to live with the condition. He is Ambassador for the Prince's Trust and Honorary Vice President of Diabetes UK. He notably headed Diabetes UK's Putting Feet First campaign to highlight the dangers of foot issues for people with the condition and to cut the amputation rate by half. For decades, Gary has made regular public appearances for the charity to campaign for greater awareness, especially within sport, and annually leads the coverage for World Diabetes Day. Many children and their parents still write to Gary for advice and encouragement. Gary Mabbott's work is a public voice for raising awareness of diabetes, breaking down many barriers and perceptions, and living with its consequences over several decades has surely inspired other diabetics to succeed in various walks of life in spite of their condition. Vice-Chancellor, I present to you Gary Mabbott, MBE, who is eminently worthy to receive the degree of Doctor of Health Honoris Causa.
By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Health, Honoris Causa. Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Chancellor, honoured guests, graduates, and the very proud mums, dads, and families. When I received a letter from the university, informing me that I had been awarded an honorary doctorate degree from this university, I felt very proud and privileged. However, I was also concerned that on this, the graduation day, I felt like an imposter Gate crashing in the graduation party. All of the students here today have worked extremely hard for years to get their degrees, and here I was being given one. Fortunately, a very good friend of mine put my mind at ease. When I told him that I had these concerns, he told me that I'm receiving this honour for the work that I've done over the last 40 years, so I didn't feel quite so bad. I grew up just down the road in Bristol. And at the age of eight, my father became the player manager of Bar City Football Club. So we spent a lot of time over those years here in this beautiful city. My father passed away last year. But I'm sure that he would have been very proud of me receiving this accolade from the university where we as a family spent so much time. I went to grammar school in Bristol, and after my O-levels... I became an apprentice footballer at Bristol Rovers Football Club. I just got into the first team at the age of 17, and I became very unwell. I was soon diagnosed with diabetes. I had to learn about the condition very quickly, and it became apparent that the doctors all thought that my career was over. We contacted three of the top specialists in the world on diabetes, and they all gave the same opinion that my career was over. They'd be unable to maintain the fitness required. So, refusing to accept this, we spoke to a fourth specialist in London. And he told me that he had not heard of a diabetic who, at my age, had gone on to a professional career in sport at this level. But he said that if I was prepared to go for it, then he would support me and back me up. And the rest, as they say, is history. People ask me if diabetes has affected my career. I tell them, yes, it has. When I wasn't a diabetic, I was playing the English third division, the Bristol Rovers. But as a diabetic, I played for 16 years at Spurs, 619 games in the Premier League. I captained the team for 11 years and proudly, proudly represented the country at all professional levels. So yes, that's how it affected me. For a number of years now, I've been patron of Diabetes UK a role that enables me to work in numerous areas where diabetics' lives can be improved. Also working endlessly to get the message across to every diabetic and their families that as long as they look after themselves, having diabetes will not stop them from achieving all of their dreams. Bath University is doing an enormous amount of research in this area. And I look forward to attending the launch of the Bath Centre for Therapeutic Innovation later this year as a keynote patient speaker. There's still a lot of work to be done on diabetes. A lot has been achieved over the years, a lot of research, but there's still a lot more that can be achieved. And hopefully, with the efforts of universities like Bath, hopefully things can continue to improve the lives of diabetics. I'm often asked about how my fellow professionals and teammates reacted to my diabetes. And to be honest, once they got used to me injecting myself at half-time and constantly doing blood tests, it says they tend to accept it. And there are a couple of... I had a few comas during my career, uh, which obviously weren't so nice, but also a couple of light-hearted situations that transpired. I was the team captain at Spurs when we purchased 
a striker called Gary Lineker from Barcelona. And when big name players joined us, it was my role as captain to help them settle into the club's ways. So Gary became my roommate. Our first away trip that season was a pre-season game in Norway. We played the game, we had a convincing win, and after the game, we all went out to have something to eat and a few drinks. So after a couple of hours, Gary Lineker left to go back to the hotel. I stayed on there with the rest of the team, and about an hour later, I returned to the hotel. I got to my room, opened the door, and the rest of the story now comes from Gary. He said he was asleep when I came in, but he heard me coming in. I apparently then took off my jeans. I started dancing around the room with my jeans, singing the current number one hit from Gloria Estefan, one, two, three, four, come on baby, say you love me. <laughs> to which Gary woke up. Now, Gary says he could not believe his first trip away with me, and here I was, the team captain, and he thought I was absolutely, completely, absolutely smashed, totally drunk, and he didn't know what to do. Fortunately for me, our goalkeeper, Eric Torsvet, was walking past the door. He heard my singing and thought, aye, aye, party in here. So he knocked on the door. Gary opened the door. And as soon as Eric saw me, he realised I was having a diabetic hypo. And of course, when your blood sugars go too low, you lose control of what you're doing. So Eric sat me down. He knew I was carrying my bag, fruit pastels. He gave me six or seven fruit pastels. And within five minutes, I'm as right as rain. Now, Gary couldn't believe this. And even still to this day, whenever I see him, he says to me, but Gary, he says, can you understand? It was our first night away together, so to speak. <laughs> he said, I'm a married man, you're single, I'll wake up and you're singing this song from Gloria Estefan. He said, what was I supposed to think? But uh, another player who I'm often asked about was a player known as Paul Gascoigne, better known as Gaza. I'm often asked what he's really like as a person. But what I've got to say is that on the field of play, he was one of the best and the most intelligent footballers I've ever played with. One of the greatest this country's ever produced. Off the field, slightly different matter. Gaza thought that the Gaza Strip is what posh people called his football kit. <laughs> Our first away game that we played after Gaza joined us it was away in Nottingham Forest. After the game finished, as players, we have a shower, get changed, then go to the players' lounge to have a drink with the other team. But being a diabetic, I've to inject myself so before every meal. Now, us pampered soccer stars, we have a lovely team coach with two chefs on the coach, a four-course meal cooked for us on the way home, with wine if we win. So I always go on the coach to do my injection. So I'm on the coach, I've got my needle out, got my syringe out, and got my insulin out. So I'm just about pulling the insulin into the needle, I clock Gaza getting on the bus. He stares at me the whole way to get to the table. He says... Gary, what are you doing? I said, well, Paul, I have sugar diabetes. Yeah, I'm a diabetic. He didn't try and explain to him what being a diabetic meant. I think he thought that sugar diabetes was a very famous boxer at the time. <laughs> so no, I have sugar diabetes. I have to inject myself. He said, what? Just while you're a footballer? I said, no, Paul. I inject myself every single day for the rest of my life. Four times a day. He went, four times a day for the rest of your life? I went, yes. He looked at me and went, cool, he said. But you can't wait to die, can you? <laughs> I looked up and there was that Gaza grin. But what a great footballer he was. But see, there are some light-hearted moments, uh, but generally it's, it's a serious condition. But it's a condition that you can continue your lives and lead a normal life with. To all the students here today, congratulations on receiving on your graduation day. And any advice that I would like to impart to you is to always go for your dreams. Aim high and make the impossible possible. When I was young, at the age of six or seven, my father put a poem on our fridge. And every time I have a setback, I always look at this poem. And I've always tried to use setbacks as a stepping stone to move forward. And I'd like to share this poem with you. It's called, If You Think You Can, You Can. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win but think you can't, so we're certain you won't. If you think you will lose, you've lost. For out of this world we find 
Success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of the mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself or you can never win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the strongest or fastest man. But sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks he can. So I'd like to say to all the graduates here, believe in yourselves and in what you can achieve. You can make a difference. And just before I finally finish up, I'd just like to say that I felt we're here for a celebration of all the graduates here today. All the families here, very proud families. And I could tell there was a lot of suppression when the awards were being announced. So I'd just like to say, let go of your reservations, please, for all the graduates here today, all of your children, are like a lot of cheering, whooping, and a massive round of applause. Go on, please, thank you. I am honoured to receiving a doctorate from the University of Bath. The belief and the values of this university are so much I hold close to my heart. I am proud to be associated with the university from here on in. Thank you very much. It's now my job to close this ceremony, but I was going to ask you to do something, and Gary pinched my line. <laughs> anyway, I still intend doing it. Um, I'd like you to give a massive big cheer for all the young people behind us who've done extraordinarily well to be here today. Go on. Go on, go on. Thank you very much. I now declare this congregation closed for the presentation of graduates and for the conferment of honorary degrees. <laughs>